Hey everybody, this is Craig Garber. Welcome to Everyone Loves Guitar. And man, um, this is a really special treat for me. I mean, I have been looking forward to this interview um, with Michael Farris Smith. Uh, he, let me go back. So I had an interview with uh, Jimbo Mathis, which I want to say thank you, Jimbo, very much for connecting us. Uh, Jimbo from Squirrel Nut Zippers. And um, he was turning me on to some other people that would be good for the show. And he goes, hey, do you know Michael Farris Smith? I said, I, I don't. I'm sorry. And he goes, well, he's a best-selling author and he's a friend of mine. And I think it'd be a great interview. So I'm like, yeah, sure, man. Let's check it out. Because to be honest, I've been wanting to uh, have some diversity on the show outside of musicians. So Michael was kind enough. First of all, he sent me some of his books. Uh, he sent me three of his books. I sat down and read two of them. His newest book, Blackwood, and uh, his book, The Fighter. I read both of them in a, you know, I started on a Sunday morning sitting out back with a cigar and I finished in the afternoon with another cigar. Uh, he's an incredible writer. Um, but what I want to do is uh, give me some feedback on this because if, if, if you're cool with this and I'm saying you listeners, let me know because I'd love to have, you know, some different kinds of creatives on here once in a blue moon. My obviously guitar players and musicians will always be my main core, but um, I think it's nice to get some diversity and everybody will be cool. And don't worry, I'm not going to like invite an accountant on here or anything like that. It's just going to be creative people. Anyway, uh, let's talk about Michael Farris Smith. He is such a deep writer and such a cool dude. And uh, anyway, let's get it. And I really want to encourage you as much as possible to read his books. Uh, let's dig into this. Michael Farris Smith is an award-winning writer of five novels. All of them have been on various best of lists and bestsellers lists. Uh, they've been on best of the year list with Esquire, Southern Living, Book Riot, and loads of other places, and have been named Indie Next List, Barnes & Noble Discover, and Amazon Best Book of the Month selections. He's been a finalist for the Southern Book Prize, the Gold Dagger Award in the UK, and the Grand Prix, Michael, can, you can do it. The Grand Prix de Lectricis in France. <laughs> this is what happens when a guy from the Bronx tries to speak French. And his essays have appeared in the New York Times, Bitter Southerner, Writer's Bone, and others. Uh, three of his books have been optioned for movies, Desperation Road, The Fighter, and his most recent book already got optioned for movie, Blackwood. And Michael is going to be, he finished the screenwriting on one, how many of the screen, uh, the, the, uh, you know, the, the, uh, movie script. All, the script, all of them, all, all of them. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Awesome. Um, and he, you wrote me, I wrote, I didn't change this Oxford. Yeah. You, he lives in Oxford, Mississippi with his wife and daughters. Um, all righty, let's get into, man. Thank you so much for your time. I am so thank happy to, you, to finally connect with you. Yeah, and he's, hey, you got to show him that too. He's got the coolest tattoo. Show him that tattoo, man. It says, what matters most is how well you walk through the fire. That's a Charles Bukowski book. Yeah, man. A Bukowski book. So, all right. I want to, I want to talk about you, but I want to talk a lot about this book because it was just like riveting. I mean, literally like from the time I tore into it, uh, till the end of it, I was on the edge of my seat. You dedicated the book to Ellen. If you're comfortable sharing, who's Ellen? Ellen is my agent. Oh, yeah. right on. She came into my life uh, six or seven years ago, man, and she was a lifesaver, and she's just great. And, you know, I dedicated, I think the first book was to my wife. My second book was to my grandfather. Third was to my daughters. I think the fighter was to my family. And then when Blackwood came around, I was like, you know what? I owe Ellen one of these. So That's, that's cool, man. Ellen. Yeah, she's great. Uh, you, you have one quote in the book in the opening, I think it's from the Bible and it pref and it, it prefaces, it's like a, uh, you know, a, a, a forward. It says foxes have dens and birds have nests, but the son of man has no place to lay his head, which is pretty deep as it is. I was curious what made you pick that particular passage. Uh, you know, it's kind of strange because I never really have an epigraph until, uh, like later in the book, like, and then something hits me. I think it takes a while for the book to kind of become something to me and me kind of like feel the thematics of it and like the spirit of it. And then I, I, I saw the, I saw that verse somewhere and it just struck me kind of as I had gone down the road now with the, with the boy and the man with Colburn and like the, the lives they had lived and were leading and like almost like this, uh, 
this kind of spiral that was going on also. And then this yeah. just quote about, about, uh, you know, about Jesus and how he was just kind of a, a rambler himself. You know, he just, he moved from place to place. He depended on community wherever he was. Um, and just that, that notion of you'll be taken care of if you just keep going, if you just keep moving it, you'll find a place. And so uh, it just seemed to marry itself to the novel and what I was feeling about it right then. I really love the way it fit and I love the power of it too. Yeah. It's really good. It was interesting because, um, both of the, the protagonists in the fighter and in Blackwood, um, were people that by nature were troubled. Yeah. And tended to push others away, but yet they both sort of found someone for them. Mm -hmm. How did you, um, how did, how did, how does something like that come about? Like, I, don't, I don't even know what to ask you because I'm like, so like, to write like this, to write a nonfiction book, man, it ain't that hard, but to write this, like, how do you, how does that, the genesis of that start? Like, where do you come up with the idea? Do you come up with the characters, the storyline, the setting? How, how does that all work for you? You know, it's weird. Like the fighter and Blackwood both kind of started differently in that the fighter started with the idea of the character, like mm -hmm. the Jack Boucher. Like I had just in my mind, this notion of this, 40 something year old busted up guy and a lot of physical pain. And I started trying to think, well, what would put him into that type of pain? And I thought, well, what if he'd have been a fighter, you know, but, but not the kind of fighter you find on a fight card or anywhere um, where there are actually restrooms and a concession stand. You know? <laughs> <laughs> what if he'd have been, you know, fighting illegally in cages, you know, for two decades. And I was like, well, damn, that's the kind of guy I want to write about. Because I thought then, okay, he's in a lot of pain. How's he going to treat it? Okay. The opioid epidemic is in the newspaper every day. I'm yeah. like, certainly, you know, taking pill after pill to make it through. And I figure, well, let's give him, you know, he's probably a bad drinker. He's probably a bad gambler. He's probably a loner. He's probably feeling very isolated. And I'm like, all right, that's the kind of dude I want to write about. And then I just started following him, you know, through the middle of the night, see what his life was like. But with Blackwood, it was different in that it was the landscape first. It was this, the kudzu. And for people out there who don't, aren't familiar with kudzu, it's the vine that ate the South. Um, the way <laughs> the, the ate the South. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but it just grows over everything. It takes over houses and creek banks and grows up and covers trees and power lines and everything. And, you know, I've been around it my whole life, but I just began to notice it differently in the last couple of years. And, it just really began to come alive for me, like, and began to be very like haunting and kind of spooky and uh, felt like something out of a nightmare, I think, sometimes for me. So I just imagine this valley just covered in the kudzu and the way it raises up over trees and things, it forms like a canopy where you can go underneath. And then I just started to put together this kind of Southern Gothic tale of what might be hiding under there, or might be lurking under there. Um, and then I just kind of put people into it who were kind of feeling that same thing. So it was like, you know, it was an idea for a guy with a fighter. It was an idea for a place in Blackwood, which was, you know, but that, that's all I really need for any story, any novel. I, I get that one thing in my mind, that one image, whatever it is, that I cannot shake and I can't sleep. And I'm thinking about it all the time. And that's how I know, like, that's your story because I'm not going to be happy until like I sit down and try to figure out what it's all about. You know, I don't need to know anything other than like that, what I just told you. And then you just, I just dive into it and I just start going and start looking, start trying to discover it as I go along. So in like, once you get one of these ideas, like for black, for Blackwood, would you write down, do you write down like descriptions, like, you know, isolated, uh, overgrown, whatever the, the, the visual or the, the feeling you have, and then try to make sure you sort of like cross out, oh, I got this one, I got, and may incorporate those into the story? No, not really, no. So well, it's just like, it comes just naturally as you're writing. Yeah, to me, like, that's what the writing, the purpose, like, the writing serves. It's like, that's where I need to go find it, is in the writing, you know? 
because for me it's um and that's that's a big reason I don't make any notes is because to me the writing needs to feel um very curious it needs to feel that notion of discovery it needs to feel investigative i think some way whether it be landscape or whether it be character or whether it be whatever like it needs to feel like you are actively pursuing the emotions the setting the atmosphere of what's going on and for me that's the writing itself i almost feel like if i start making notes or something like that and i do have that checklist then i'm not letting my imagination like just be free like, okay. I feel like I'm trying, then I'm trying to like write to that list or I'm trying to write to this, uh, you know, group of words I've got instead of like, okay, I know how I'm feeling about it. I know how I'm kind of imagining, let's go see what it's all about. And that way I'm not, I don't have to kind of, you know, peek over to the side and see if I'm doing, um, doing things the right way. Cause I, I, I worry about, um, adhering to, to too much of a philosophy, like while I'm, trying to create i want i want the thing to be free to just like take off and develop its own life what do you do though like when you're like because as you're visualizing this thing you, you your mind's probably going a million miles yeah um, how do you keep up like like i'd be worried about shit i'm gonna forget all this let me just make some notes how do you yeah. how do you not do that well what i'll do is i'll work in the morning and like when i get done working i will make myself like two or three notes for like where i feel like tomorrow. I'm going to sit down like I'll have a jumping off place, you know? Okay. And then I try to let it go. And I learned, I learned this from like, from Hemingway, from reading Hemingway. Hemingway used to go work in the morning and then he would say he would leave his work and let his subconscious have it the rest of his day. Right. Right. So he could just, it would just marinate in him. So like, if you were to see my phone, actually something will pop in my head in the course of a day, like a piece of cool piece of dialogue. I think I might've missed from before. Like, Maybe uh maybe I've changed my mind about what I want to do tomorrow. And on my phone, on notes, I'll just, you know, make a little note so that <laughs> I have it somewhere. Or I wake up in the middle of the night, too. I do that a lot when yeah. I'm in the middle of a novel. I don't sleep for months when I'm in the middle of a novel because my mind is just like in this constant mode of creation. And um, And I've learned if you wake up in the middle of the night and you have an idea, you better write it down because... <laughs> doesn't matter how great the idea is when you wake up in the morning, it's gone. If you Absolutely, <laughs> man. Yeah, totally. So, you know, I, I work, you know, and I'm, I don't really have like an outline or anything like that I'm working off of, but I do make notes almost like a little breadcrumb trail as I'm going along to kind of lead me, lead me in that, in whatever direction I'm going. You said you work in the morning. What's morning for you? Uh, well, we have two daughters and my routine for, past i don't know six or seven years has been we get up we get the girls up out the door i take them to school and then i have a little writing studio space that i go to which i'm sitting in right now um and I, i'm usually here by about 8 15 oh, okay make some coffee 8 30 and then you know get right to work i'd really love to work in the morning before anything else like before I have to be daddy or before I have to go pay a bill or run an errand or any, anything that deals with life can throw you off like that and can ruin your creative impulse. So I, I, I come to it first thing in the morning. I look forward to it. I think my mind gets ready for it in some way. I cut off the Wi-Fi and the phone and everything. And I just really like focus. That's my time. Um, you know, and I try to do that Monday through Friday, you know, be very habitual about it. That was something I learned too from, you know, reading about other authors and just artists in general about how important it is to be consistent and like yeah. doing what you're doing. And so how long will you write for it? You start at 8.30, when do you finish? Uh, Ball, I mean, obviously it changes. A couple right? hours. A couple hours. Really? Yeah, a couple, three, maybe three. I don't know. It depends on how much time I have. I have a goal of a thousand words, you know, that's kind of like what I'm okay. so you is... sit down and the lightning strikes and you look up and in 48 minutes, you you're at 1100 words, like something else is just taken over and just like, it's just comes pouring out of you. And then sometimes you sit there for three hours and you look down at your word count and you're like 280 words and you're just going, my God, <laughs> what is happening here? You know? <laughs> So I try to spit out a thousand, you know, sometimes you get there, sometimes you don't. And sometimes it comes easy and sometimes you got to work a little harder for it. Um, but I've learned like, 
you know, a thousand words a day or even close to that. Like, and if you do it consistently, man, that piles up. Like, yeah. you know, I mean, I wrote my first bigger novel rivers with, um, teaching a full load of classes. We had a newborn in the house. We had a five-year-old in the house. My wife worked full time. She was gone one or two nights a week with her job. And I wrote that literally like sitting down in like 30 and 45 minute pockets in the morning, just trying to do what I could. And I looked up and in a year, like I had a draft, a draft, you know, because I just went to it just a little bit, a little bit, a little bit. So that's kind of how I am too. Like, I think the notion, um, a lot of people have for wanting to be a writer or a musician or whatever it is that you have to have these ginormous like pockets of time to do it. And that's not true because that's not realistic. Nobody has that unless, you know, you're born with the ability to do that and yeah. to have that time and that leisure. And even then I think, uh, that leads to a lot of, you know, screwing around, you know, instead of doing what you're supposed to do, but you can, I mean, you can sit down and work 30, 45 minutes a day on something you want to do creatively and you look up and in a month, man, you have, you have something that wasn't there before, right? right, right. Something that you can build on and something that you can see like starting to have its own life, which is, you know, we worry a lot about the end when we really like need to be thinking about like, what can I do today? You know, right now. Yeah, man, I agree with you. That. And that's once I adopted that attitude about it, like things really changed, like my production really went up. Uh, I think I got better as a writer because I was doing it more often. Even, you know, it wasn't three hours a day, but it was 30 minutes to an hour. And now I've got time to spend a couple hours on it, you know? And so, uh, it's just, the, it's keeping the tool sharp. I think is really, really important. You know? Yeah, I agree, agree with you. For most of my life, up until the last, I don't know, five, seven years, I was that guy when I had a project to do, I would not sleep for five days. Yeah. And um, it was a big mistake because, A, I never enjoyed what I was doing because I was so focused on getting it done. Yeah. So like you said, there's no in the moment aspect about it. And then... uh. I had some clients that I noticed in my marketing business that they were totally opposite, man. They would just exactly what you do, pick away an hour a day, an hour and two hours a day, but every day. And they got their stuff, the joy they had in doing things was so yeah. much greater, you know? Yeah. And I, I said, man, I need to stop and do that. I think it's a really smart thing what you do. Well, what it does is it relieves that anxiety that you're talking about. <laughs> yeah, man. But you know, like when I leave out of here in the morning, I know that I've done my work for the day and I can feel good. And we all, I think, feel better psychologically when we're doing something we enjoy. And yeah. like, I just feel, it feels better, you know, and it, it removes that anxiety of thinking about it, thinking about it, thinking about it, like feeling it coming towards you when you're just kind of pecking at it a little bit all the time, you know, yeah. um, it stays with you. Um, it stays sharp in you. You're not, mad at yourself for putting it off you know you just kind of you go and chip away and all of a sudden you have something that you know you hopefully love or at least that's proof that you've been going to it every day you know? yeah totally it's like a diet man you can't like eat really healthy every other day or you know two days a week i'm really clean and the other five days i'm eating garbage yeah or go work out once a week you know and like walk around then soar for five days. <laughs> yeah. Say, how come I'm not making any gains? <laughs> um, okay. I want to talk about um, one of the main characters in the book, Celia, her mom was a psychic. See, and this is the shit that I really love about your writing. And I don't, that I'm so blown away by it. Like, why did you choose that profession? Like, is, is there like any significance that to feel what's going on with people or spirits in your own life or like what's your take on psychics? Because I mean, she could have been anything, but you picked the psychic and that prompted curiosity in the reader. Yeah. You know, if you had picked, you know, if she was a cost accountant, maybe not so much, you know? <laughs> well, uh, well, I think you kind of touched on it. Like it piques curiosity in the reader. Like it piques curiosity in me too. Okay. Like I've got this guy who's very distraught and he's wandering through the night and he's looking for answers and he sees this giant blue neon hand shining in the dark, you know, 
psychic readings. And of course that's going to, yeah, that's where I need to go, you know? And, um, I don't know that that whole world is very fascinating to me, not just like the psychic reading world, but this, the whole, the whole trade of trying to get answers, you know, for yeah. a certain amount of money, you know, you give me this and I'll give you your answers. Right. We all know it's bullshit. You got to know it's bullshit, right? Yeah. But part of you wants to believe it. And of part course. of you is going to believe it because you're going to hear what you want to hear. And, and I think maybe there is some merit in that and giving us that hope and giving us that confidence that things maybe are going to be okay. Because I don't think people walk into those places, and I could be wrong, feeling necessarily good about things, but hopefully maybe they walk out feeling good about things. Yeah, they're selling that's, hope, man. That's worth twenty five dollars. Hell some, yeah! I, think. I mean, it's it's an eye kind of therapy session. I think maybe in some way it is, even man. though you know it's bullshit, right? Yeah. yeah. But still, it's, if it's feeding feeding you in some kind of way, you know, making you feel better for a little while, then maybe you know there that that's the merit in it. But I, I, I it's, it's kind of spooky too, you know. Very much. Like, where, what's he doing? Like. Of course. I mean, why not go to a psychic in the middle of the night in this decrepit old Victorian house with <laughs> isolated at this kudzu covered valley with the blue neon like shining out into the night, like some spiritual beacon, you know, drawing him toward it. You know, of course, that, that's the scene I want to write, you know. Yeah, that's what I want to. That's the table I want to sit down at you know, myself. So you're almost writing it's a, it's as much a journey of curiosity and joy for you initially as it is for us reading it. Absolutely. Yeah. That is really so um wow. That's really great, man. I, I just learned a lot from that. That's really cool. I mean, I, I really wow. the, the great probably the biggest part of it for me is keeping myself interested and entertained and challenged too, like I was talking about this on maybe an interview yesterday and we were talking about some of these things. And um, I said, I can usually tell when a novel is going the right way, when I begin to feel a little bit uncomfortable, I think emotionally because I'm going into places that I haven't been before that I'm unfamiliar with. And okay. I used to kind of back away from that when I first started out because I was like, Oh, that's going to be too hard. That's but over now, my head. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I'm, I'm not familiar with this. But now, like when, when I feel that thing move in me in the novel, when I, I, something changes or like I realize I'm in kind of uncharted place emotionally or even just from a curiosity standpoint, like I see that as the thing that I really need to embrace and go along with. Because if it's moving me and if it's curious to me, then the great chance is that it's going to translate to the reader who's holding the book wherever they are. You know, that same notion of, oh, I've moved somewhere different now, you know, I'm sensing, I'm feeling yeah. something different than I did. Are you like that in all aspects of your life in general? Like, do you tend to be like, I know for me, I've, oh, I'm always trying to be better, like mentally as a dad, as a husband, you know, just as a more productive human being, like to, to get issues resolved or look a little further. Mm -hmm. I don't know if I, I, maybe I'm like that in all areas of my life, but definitely with like personal headspace I am. Are, are you yeah. like that with things outside of, you know, writing? Yeah. I think probably. Yeah. Um, just, you know, we talked about this a little before we prepping for the interview with my dad being a preacher and me kind yeah. of growing up in that um environment and then like getting to be a teenager and kind of uh getting disillusioned with it in some ways like um i don't know i think i've just had always had a lot of questions you know and i think doubt is doubt is certainly part of you know your spiritual nature or else we wouldn't have a spiritual nature i mean <laughs> felt like you all the answers and you know felt comfortable with everything then what's the point you what's know the <laughs> but you, you do meet people like that from time to time and you're like oh my god please stop talking man <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm very wary of people who think they have shit figured out like <laughs> yeah. Yeah. but um 
I mean, to me, and I think, um, I think probably life is as much about the questions or more about the questions than it is the answers really yeah, for me, you know, um, because you, you, you're going to evolve whether you want to or not. I mean, it's just impossible to stay in one place. Like your thoughts are going to, your thoughts are going to change. Your people are going to come in and out of your life. You're going to lose somebody. You're going to find somebody. I mean, you're just going to be in this constant state of, uh, regeneration i think almost so the questions are the really interesting things to me i mean and i think searching for for answers is one of the things we're supposed to do i mean i mean yeah, we were given, we were given these we were given a head and a heart and a spirit not to just you know set it on the shelf and let it be and follow blindly well i think we're supposed to question and we're supposed to try to discover and i feel like i do that in my writing and i do feel like i do it in my personal life and um, you know, as a father, as a husband, as a friend, I think, um, you know, I don't know whether that helps me be a good father, husband, friend, or if it makes me a worse one, I don't know, but I do think it's, oh, it's, who I am. it's just positive always, you know, it's interesting though. Um, broken people, you know, once in a while you do meet someone who's broken and, and many times it's not through their own fault. It's through circumstances. Right. But most people that are broken cannot do that. But yet the characters that you, in these two books anyway, um, they were both pretty broken, but they still did that. They still had questions and they still, uh, y you know, at the end of the fighter, that whole thing, the way um, it, that turns around, that was just like, he really wanted some, you know, he wanted resolution. He wanted, you know, that was, I was really surprised that a guy who was so broken wanted that. Yeah. It's something I learned from the, from the uh, writers that I admire and read like Cormac McCarthy, um, Flannery O'Connor, Carson McCullers, uh, William Gay, Larry Brown had a big impact on me though. He was an Oxford, Mississippi writer, um, passed away probably about, I think it was Oh four maybe, but he, he was a lot like me. Um, and that he was kind of a working class guy, worked a ton of different jobs. He got to be like 29, 30 years old. He'd been a voracious reader his whole life. He just decided, I want to try this, you know, I, I want to sit down and try it. Um, because I'm sick of doing all this other shit, you know, and he felt passionate about it too. He said it was the first time he felt passionate about anything really in his life. And that was me when I was about 29 or 30, I'd been all over the place and worked a hundred different jobs but I've been reading a lot and I finally decided like, I think I'm going to try this. I didn't even know what it meant. Um, but I sat down anyway, but what Larry used to do and what I learned from him was he was always very tough on his characters. He called it sandbagging. And he said, I'm going to pile as much on my characters as I possibly can to see if they can take it and see how they're going to react. And I oh, pretty much adapted wow. that philosophy into my own work very early on. And I think, uh, that's really how I am. It's like, I want to challenge them emotionally, physically, socioeconomically, uh, socioeconomically, like whatever. I want to see how much I can pile on them and see if they'll still keep fighting, you know? Cause that's how life is. I mean, it's how, yeah. it's how life is. Like you only find out about somebody when something goes bad, you know, when somebody's right. having a good day, you're not going to learn anything about them. But you let <laughs> shit hit the fan. And that's when we find out like what you're made of. Oh, a hundred percent. Yeah, man, that is really brilliant that you're willing to pile because it's funny. I've noticed um, over the years, I don't watch a lot of TV, but I'll watch some series once in a while with my wife and I'll notice I say, man, it's so unbelievable what some of these characters have to go through. And it's the same thing. They're just piling more and more. And that's what keeps you engaged. Like, how the hell are they going to get out of this one? That's right. That's, yeah, that's the, that's the sign, too, is like uh I mean, talking about before where uh, when I feel like I'm being like moved emotionally or challenged emotionally, I see that as a sign. The other sign for me is like when I go, just like you said, when I start thinking, how in the hell am I going to get them out of there? <laughs> that's <laughs> now, cool, man. I, that's like, that's the moment I'm waiting for. Like when I realize I don't know how anybody's going to get out of this. Because then wow. if, you, if you don't know, then probably nobody else knows either. 
the cool thing about that is, man, um, sorry, I'm just taking some notes. The cool thing about that is you get to be a hero for figuring that out, like to yourself, like, hey, man, like, you know, you get a great sense. But the character gets to be a hero, too. Yeah. That is awesome, man. Really cool. It's Shit. always interesting to see how they're going to come out of it, you know? Have, have you ever read about um, cold reading? Mm-mm. Okay, so cold reading is the science of psychic. And it's a whole, um, there's a guy in England who's written a lot of books on this. And he's been a, you know, but there's a, it's a system that good psychics have. It's called cold reading. Like, I guess, because you're walking in someone's cold and you got to give them a reading. Yeah. And there's certain things that they look for and certain triggers and certain things they say. And uh, it's really fascinating because you get to see how the whole psychic thing works it's it's pretty clever and you can't you have to be pretty smart to do that effectively yeah so, yeah it was interesting i would think um, so yeah it was really cool um in in the book between colburn and celia there's something like really comforting about their relationship it's almost like they're two lost souls and that have connected over over this mutual emptiness sort of mm -hmm. And I was curious, did you, in, do you think that's what a part of what connects people in relationships in general? Like, um, like the things that torture us kind of connect us as well. Cause I, I, what made me think of that is I noticed as I've gotten older, uh, and maybe I was always like this, but I wasn't aware of it. The people I connect best with, there's something we have in common that's, I'm going to say not positive, but um, some, some survival skill. Yeah. And it's really weird because it's an unspoken thing, but you just feel this connection. And then as you talk to the person, it's like, oh, this is the shit I've been through. Oh, this is, and it's really weird. So I was curious, like, what is your take on that in general? I mean, I pretty much agree with you. Yeah. I just described it. I mean, I do think uh, people drift toward one another um and i think it's just part of the universe um who have um kind of experienced the same things um feel some of the same things are trying to recover from some of the same things and yeah, i think that's great yeah. and colburn i think they recognize this in one another and let's face it we're all looking for somebody who gets us right <laughs> yeah right you know on. I mean? <laughs> who understands us you know who we don't have to explain ourselves to i mean yes. pain in the ass. you know you're not going to be friends with somebody if you have to keep explaining yourself to them right yeah so if they're not <laughs> this ain't gonna happen <laughs> no man I, I don't even give that a time to, I don't even like waste energy. I don't, no, nothing to get, like, nothing to, it, it's just not a good use of time. It's like, you know, it's like saying, I want to be six feet tall. Let me work on that. It ain't going to happen. <laughs> That's right. But I think we all have that inherent desire to just be understood. And yeah. um, if you can recognize that in someone, and if you can, particularly if you can recognize it in each other, you know, yeah. what, what kind of a, what well, kind of a, it's kind of a, just a feeling of ease and peace and yes. you know, that, um, and so I think when my characters find those moments, fortunately they, they recognize them. And I think that's why Celia and Colburn kind of fall into one another's because they both have these similar things kind of going through them. Um, and they, they feel completely at ease with one another. One of my favorite scenes in the novel is when she closes the doors to the bar and they sit there in the dark and she turns off all the lights except for the beer signs. Yeah. And it's just the glow of the beer signs. And she goes, sometimes I just sit here by myself all night and just dream. And I've never had anybody sit here and dream with me. We used to, do you want to stay and just dream with me and sit here? And they have that just wonderful night where they just sit there yeah. with one another, you know, and they don't have to, you know, deliver any manifesto to one another. They don't have to, you know, question one another. They don't have to give life histories to one another. They can just be there together yeah. and they glow in the smoke and just enjoy it. Yeah, man, you do a great, a really wonderful job of making those connections in there, man. I mean, just in, in, in 
in the, all the books you write, man, it's very, um, very organic how that comes about. You do a really, really good job of that. Thank you. Um, this was pretty intense. Uh, it, it, for anybody listening, it's, it's a quote on the bottom of page 50 in Blackwood. It says he looked, and this is Colburn and Celia. He looked at her empty hand. No, it's Colburn and his mom. Yeah. He looked again at her empty hand and it was the hand of a stranger, not the hand of a mother, not the hand of a friend, not the hand of comfort. And even though she had given birth to him against the wrath of his father, she had not loved him the way she should have loved. How the hell did you um, come up with that moment? That's like complete desperation and disconnection. How did, how did you evoke that? I mean, like where, where did you dig inside of yourself to come up with that, man? That was pretty fucking intense. I don't know, man. That was pretty intense. Listen, to <laughs> it was, man. I was like, "Holy shit!" Uh, you know, that's that's a moment of betrayal right there that has led up to that. Um, yeah, well, that's a he, lifetime of betrayal. Yeah, a life. Yeah, a lifetime yeah. of betrayal. And he's, I think, sixteen, fifteen, sixteen years old when he comes to that moment where he it all comes clear for him. Um, Which is pretty amazing as that a character that neglected had the uh, uh, wherewithal and the awareness to come to that conclusion at that young age. Right. Right. You know, I don't know where it comes from. Um, I mean, we're the sum of our parts, I suppose. I think it's really, it's been my willingness as a writer. And I think as an artist to just let myself um, go yeah. uh, to where, to whatever place. And it, it's hard to, it's kind of hard to answer because I don't know what I, mood I was in that day that I wrote that, you know? Sure. Yeah. I don't know what was going on in the news. I don't know um, what I walked into the, my workspace carrying with me that morning when I wrote that scene. Um, but I've, I've been willing over the past few years in particular to really let myself just go in whatever direction it is I'm, I'm going in, whether it be one of those peaceful moments between Celia and Colburn or whether it's one of these really dark moments of betrayal and isolation and emptiness that you feel there with Colburn and his mother. Because I just think that's the only way you can do it as a artist and as a, as a writer, you've got to be willing to let yourself, uh, go fully into those places, whether it's the dark or the light. Um, it's very rewarding to me to empty myself in that way too. Yeah. Um, I think at the end of a day like that, and even to just listen to you read that now, it's, um, <laughs> it, it tells me something about myself, like to hear it read back to me, you know? Um, and I, I kind of wonder too, like where I was that morning. Or where, yeah. I was, where I was the night before as I was laying there thinking about it, you know. Like when I get there in the morning, he's going to sit down with his mother and they're going to find out. Like just, but, um, you know, you can't play it safe, right? I think any musician will tell you, any writer, any yeah. artist, anybody, it, the moment you start playing it safe, you're screwed. Um, well, and you I just, went for it here, man. And yeah, you hit the home run, a grand that, slam as far as I'm concerned. Well, thank you. Um it's just, I've, I've let myself go and I've let myself stop worrying about um, how it's going to feel or look to other people, how disturbed <laughs> I think I might be or whatever. Um, I just, you just gotta, you gotta go for it, man. You gotta like peel back every layer. And to me, that was peeling back to the bare absolute bone for that yeah. relationship and being as honest as I could with it too, which is, I think is very important. Well, I gotta be honest with you. I, I related to this for, for better or worse. I understood this, but I didn't come to this conclusion at 16. Yeah. yeah. And that's what I was. So I was like, Oh my God, this to have the wherewithal that was like, you know, heavy, heavy. Um, I think I might've mentioned this to you. I, I read, um, uh, Jonathan Lethem, one of his books, maybe motherless Brooklyn, and he, he has a line in there and it reminded me of this. It says something like whatever the dad's name and the guy's thinking wasn't the dad I was meant to have. Uh, the mom's name wasn't the mom I was meant to have. And nobody was, nobody is who they said they were. 
Right. right yeah, right. and it was it reminded me of this, but this <laughs> this was much more emotional and descriptive. Yeah. Like, holy crap, man. Really, I mean, so well done, man. Thank you. You're welcome. Well, the other thing I've kind of realized with it too is that we are capable of all kinds of emotions at any point, you know. Mm. And I, I think it, it largely, well, it greatly depends on what someone has been through mm. or experienced. But our emotions are as a, just alive at, at four, three, four, five, six, seven years old as they are when we're 40, 50, you know, whatever. And we have a great depth at all times. And it just, certain things bring it out mm. in certain moments. And I think no matter like what I put on the page, someone's going to relate to it besides me. I certainly relate to it Absolutely. somewhere else. I couldn't write it, but I think like you, for instance, like sitting in Tampa, Florida, I was like, Holy shit. And like That's why I, <laughs> I, when I finished this book, I felt like, and this sounds ridiculous. Cause it's, you know, it's, I didn't, I said, man, there's something about this guy that is a kindred spirit of mine. And I know that sounds ridiculous because people, you know, that's like someone listening to Steven Tyler saying, oh man, I, and I didn't mean it like that. Like, oh, we have a, but I was like that you had that ability to evoke that. I had so much respect for that. And so much, it, whether you had experienced it or not. Um, and that, that for me is the, what I love so much about talking to creative people because uh, it allows me, because creative people are very free with their emotions, and it allows me to be freer with mine. Right. Yeah. And yeah, and so I was like, "Wow, this is so powerful!" I was just blown away by how powerful this was, man. Thank and, you. I, I feel the same way though. Like when I come across a, an author or a book or a poem, I mean, I've got Bukowski on my forearm. When I come across <laughs> something like yeah. that, you, you feel that kindred nature um, yeah. of, of emotion and just. Um, liberation i think in some ways yeah. knowing that other people feel the same way some way yeah yeah well i just want to make i wasn't like psycho like oh i gotta like you know move in with this guy you know like <laughs> i don't want to think i'm cr no because people are like that sometimes they hear you because i get some weird emails like oh <laughs> they're nice but they're like a little creepy <laughs> you know yeah. you know <laughs> it's like, so it wasn't like that it was just like man this guy really relate to some of the yeah. stuff he's saying um uh uh, we talked about this before we started recording and I just want to ask it to you because um, anybody listening to this might be curious. An overriding theme of the book of both books actually is uh, you know, the, the examination and the far reaching consequences of the damage done from like bad parenting basically, or yeah. no parenting. And, and how deep that, that runs and for how long into your life it runs. And, and the truth is, if that's left unchecked, it just stays with you forever, man. But if you're comfortable answering, I was curious, is this something you experience yourself? And if not, um, what prompted you to think about that? And maybe you, you, you some have answered that a little bit about pushing yourself, but. Uh, actually I had a pretty good childhood, you know, um, yeah. we grew up in small Mississippi towns. Uh, my dad was a Southern Baptist preacher. I, I guess he still is, uh, though he's retired. My mother was a school teacher. Um, you know, I lived one of those boyhoods of walking to the ballpark and playing ball and riding my bike and, you know, having a dog follow me around having a bunch of friends. We played, you know, fox and hound in the woods and, had bottle rocket wards and all kinds of dumb shit. And, uh, but what my mom and dad really taught me and what I saw through his work with the church was, um, they taught me a sense of empathy of recognizing other people and their troubles and trying to put yourself in their shoes and understand what they've been through, um, and where they're coming from. And I can remember as a kid, like, um, like my dad would get a call like in the middle of the night or somebody would just stop by the church one day and it would be somebody just passing through town and they would be like, just asking for like some gas money and like maybe some $20 for food, you know? And that, that was their answer to find the preacher in this little town and ask him for some help. Them being very transient, just like, 
and who knows where they were going to be the next day. And sometimes they would have, they sometimes would be alone. Sometimes it'd be a family, you know, I, I, I really remember that, you know, and then once I got to be a teenager, I kind of felt some disillusionment with the church because of some things that happened and I kind of got away from it. And I really began to doubt and question. And that really set me off over the next, I don't know, probably 10 or 12 years living in a bunch of different places and experiencing a lot of different people and like seeing things, you know, and that sense of empathy kind of staying with me. Um, and then eventually I married, um, my wife of 20 years now, and she is about the most empathetic and caring person like you can find. And she's a social worker. So the whole time we've been married, like she's, she, like she gets up every day and tries to help other people. I mean, that's what she does. Chill right. tries to help kids and families like every day. And I've been privy to those things that she's had to deal with. And she's had to see like, it's, it's like, I almost feel like everybody should have to have to look behind that curtain sometimes to realize you never know where someone is coming from. Yeah. Because when you're standing beside somebody who's 30, 40 years old, 22 years old, you never know what their previous years were like, like what circumstance they may have survived or come out of. And then becoming a father myself, I think those feelings of uh, uh, almost desperate feelings for um the things that other people endure and go through helpless yeah. people, you know, children and things. Um, just, just kind of shit that'll keep you up at night when you know about it. Like when my wife comes through the door, she doesn't do so much like case by case going out to houses now, like she used to. But I, I used to like know when she came through the door, like what kind of day she had or what she'd seen. You could just see it on her face before she even like, yeah, of course. Got into the living room, you know? Um, and so that's been like really a part of kind of my consciousness too for a long time now. Um, so when I sit down to write, I think I'm, I'm writing a lot of times about things that um, I see and recognize and the things that I know are out there. And, that, and I think I've come to realize too that uh, although I fall short of it, just like everybody does, no matter how much empathy you have and no, how, no matter how many times you go, well, I, I'll never judge anybody again because of this thing I just learned about this person. How could I be so stupid? Yeah. You do you fall back into it, but you just, you never know like who you're sitting next to, like what they've been through. What or what they've, they've even been through last week sometimes. Is the, or you what, know, yeah. Like, what they're like. Yeah. Currently. yeah. I, I think lack of empathy is just one of the worst things anybody can have for another person. And it, it drives me crazy when, you know, especially now the way the temperament of the country, the past few years, where it's just pink finger pointing here, finger pointing there. These people are that way. Those people are that way. And it's just seems like a tremendous amount of judgment. And I know that, ju I know that. What do you do? What are you doing with that information? Like you're going to change someone's mind? <laughs> well, if I yell louder, it doesn't work. It's like changing the price of lettuce, man. Ain't going to happen. You know, I mean, you know. Black, I think that plays out in Blackwood. Yeah, the notion of judgment plays out in Blackwood in ways that I wasn't really expecting. I think the last four pages of that book I could have never seen coming, and when when those pages came wow, out, wow, man, I just got goosebumps because they were amazing. Those last four pages, as I've told you, specific. I mean, that was, that's really cool. Yeah, and I, yeah. I think it, it came from that. I think it came from uh, just all of that that I just kind of mentioned, which I know was a lot, but um, I just kind of arrived at it. And I guess that's my way of dealing with it. Uh, yeah. Sorting things out. I mean, I, I believe that, uh, like I could feel in the fighter that I was probably sorting some things out. And I know in Blackwood, it was a continuation of that. Like I, I know I was trying to sort some things out in Blackwood. And um, I, I think those last few pages of Blackwood, especially was just kind of the culmination of that whole experience of that novel. Yeah. Where it kind of was leading me the whole time. Uh, I have no idea if that answered the question or not. But it, no, I don't either. I forgot. I haven't forgot the question was, but it was it was on. <laughs> it was great. Uh, but I wanted to say something to the everybody listening. Uh, Michael has a great story. He mentioned that he got disillusioned with the church for a while. Um, 
I'm going to have him back on the show to talk about this. He has, he, he wrote a wonderful uh, article. Like a, was it a short story or just like a like an essay, I guess. And it, where where is that? Because it was so mo- I was like, holy shit, yeah. man. Where where is that? That was published with Writer's Bone, writersbone.com. Okay, so go to writersbone.com and look up Michael Farris Smith, Farris F A R R I S. He he has a really great essay in there about what caused his disillusionment uh with the church and with just life and people in general and it's a very extremely valid conclusion to jump to after going through uh that what he went through and his family went through so check that out and you know i'm gonna have him back on the show to talk about that and uh, and anything else he wants to talk about to be honest with you uh but it was really good um you mentioned it what's really interesting about the empathy thing that you talked about is damaged people don't generally have a lot of that because it's been burned out. They're so preoccupied with surviving like literally in a moment by moment basis to sometimes that the, the having empathy, there's just no bandwidth for that or nobody or nobody taught them that either. Cause if you're in that situation, yet your characters all had a soft side. Mm -hmm. You know, they all were vulnerable. And uh, how, how did you balance, like, how did you sort of balance that? Or um, I don't even know the right question to ask you. Um, how did you manage to, to, to do that? Well, I think um, all you said is, is right. I agree with all that. I think one thing that happens in the novels, uh, in The Fighter and in Blackwood, is... Um, you mentioned nobody a lot of times, like you have to be taught empathy, I think. Oh, um, watch it. If not yeah. taught it, you have to see it in action. Yeah, you got to have examples of it. And I think yeah. in the, both the fighter and Blackwood, there are examples of empathy to these characters to where they, you know, in the fighter, Marianne, the foster mother that. Oh you know, yeah. Who shows him truly what Uncondi- love is. Unconditional love. Unconditional love is. And she's got, she just gives him everything, you know, to a kid who's never had anything. Um, at, at her own expense. At her to, own To some expense. degree, yeah. And though it takes him a long time to circle back around to what he's done and uh, finding that, having that soft spot, it, it's, it's there. It, you know, it was there early. Um, and then in Blackwood, too, I think Celia serves that role for Colbert, certainly. Yeah. And the way she acts with the boy the way she helps to feed him while everybody else in town is kind of like trying to get him away from the garbage, stop digging in my garbage. You know, she's calling the boy over and giving him a plate of food and she's giving him a bag of cans so he can take him to the risk, you know, and get his couple dollars for, and Colburn's like seeing that he's like on the periphery of that and noticing that. And there's that one scene where he comes out into the alley and he's really pissed off about something. And the boy is back there and he lashes out at him. Yeah. And so does like Celia's right behind him and he he's embarrassed by what he's done um so I think those moments of te- teaching moments I think that they're experiencing through other people like uh like we get in real life you know we see other people if you see if you see someone do an act of kindness you're very likely to turn around and perform an act of kindness at some point yeah um, man yeah so I think like- they do get that they've got a lot of things built up in them there's a lot of bitterness there's a lot of heartbreak but they have been given like moments of, of teaching moments of like empathy and compassion. I think that give them just enough to where they can, they can make it through when given the opportunity. Hopefully, yeah, it, was, anyway. it was very tender how you did that. All those little subtle things, man. It was really, really cool. Um, another lesson uh, is, is, you, you know, that these broken characters uh, is the importance of asking for help. And, uh, and, and not letting these struggles or these setbacks to find you, uh, which I think is one of the great things about, you know, this country, to be honest with you, that you can, it's up to you to, you can get a second chance anytime you want. It's up to you to take it. I mean, you got people that are all walks of life doing bad things or not, you know, and then it's up to them to, to turn things around. Um, where did you, where did you get the idea of uh, 
that about this reluctance to ask for help. It's very difficult for these guys to do that. Yeah. Um, it felt to me early on in Blackwood that mental health was going to kind of be an issue. Um, mental illness. I think I saw it first in the man with the man, the woman and the boy. Yeah. Uh, that was amazing how that opened. I was just like blown away than where it took you, man. That was really cool how you did that, man. It was yeah. like you hooked like right away. You hooked, the reader immediately like immediately right on it was like what you know what's this about man sorry Good. to interrupt you it was it like worked. awesome yeah it was it worked believe me man but i just felt like you know that that little town i created is so stagnant and it's just like it's so just like it's almost like it's just hit pause the whole town and um i felt the note from from the beginning from the opening scene when Colburn sees his father do what he does and then from the owning of the man and the woman and the boy rolling into town I, f I just got the sense that it was going to be a spiral and I knew that mental health would probably have something to do with that um, I, th I don't think these people are even really know that they can ask for help you know or that, or that there are things they can do and it almost feels like a devolvement of of people as the novel goes on instead of an evolution they feel like they almost feels like they're going backwards and i think a lot of it has to do with the fact that they're not asking for help they're just like living in their own kind of nightmare and yeah. um, not really trying to do much to get out of it other than just uh make it through one day to the next you know um but i felt the mental health kind of issue with a lot of characters in the book not just colburn and like the man but um I think even Meyer, like the sheriff, like he's just, Oh he yeah. Hasn't, he hasn't needed to be bothered. And all of a sudden now he's got some real problems and now he's bothered and he doesn't know how to handle it. He absolutely has no idea what to do. Yeah. Um, it was great how you did that. Like, and you, you kind of, I mean, the guy's drinking every moment he can, you know, and you got the sense that he's not just having a drink, like at the end of a hard week or something, yeah. you know, he's like drinking to, to get through the next moment. And he's got the back problems and stuff. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, that was really. I mean, good. it's um, I, you know, I think we all. I think I don't know that we. I can speak for myself. It's hard to ask for help sometimes. You know, I mean, oh, I think it's... people see it as a sign of weakness. You know, maybe see it as nobody wants to act like something's like wrong with them, or like show somebody else there's something wrong with them, or they feel like something's wrong. And I think it's also you have to be willing to like pull the curtain back on yourself in some ways and those aren't easy things to do and i think certainly yeah, here part of what's going on in blackwood is these characters are very protective of themselves to the point where it's really harmful to them you know yeah yeah no, and therefore and therefore it becomes harmful to everybody else you know when those <laughs> things build up and back up at some point it's going to have an outward effect and i think we certainly get that in the story yeah man 100 percent uh blackwood since that's the most recent book, what um, what was going on in your life? Was there anything in particular going on, good, it's, bad, unusual? I think really. Um, so I wrote. I probably wrote Blackwood. I guess. Um, I think I started it. it had to be in seventeen. I probably wrote it in seventeen, eighteen, because it came out finished. So I think really I was writing it in the midst of this great American divide, you know, where right. it's just, I mean, I got to where like I couldn't watch the news and I wouldn't go on social media because I was just so, so kind of depressed and angry and, and I don't know, hopeless, I think about just the nature of things. Um, and not even, I want, I mean, I don't, I'm not trying to sound political about it, but I think just the way in which people are treating each other, Oh, it's awful, in man. This country, you it's know, just, it's just awful. It, I, I mean, I the way the way people like who have power haven't done anything to temper that, but instead they stoke the fires. Stoke, of it, yeah, man. Right. Which makes it worse. I mean, it's like that's not what we're supposed to be doing, and that's not how we're supposed to be like treating one another. And so that I think that was on my mind constantly to the point to where I had to like truly work to avoid it. Um, yeah. Because it was putting me in a really dark place. I mean, we all got enough shit going on in our own lives with our own relationships and children and paying bills and this and that and the other. And then you're constantly bombarded with this land, this just 
torrent of negativity um, mm -hmm. from social media, from the news, from the higher ups, from every direction you can possibly look. And it just, it's a heavy weight, man. And I, I don't think the mental health of the country has probably been that great over the past two or three years, to be honest. Um, yeah. It's been I, nice now. I've seen people take a break. Yeah. COVID, yeah. not, yeah. you know, uh, picking on it. And, you, you know, I, I don't yeah. understand it, to be honest with you. I don't wow. understand the, I've, I've actually done research on it because I was so con, uh, puzzled. And, and basically, people feel compelled to take a side. Yeah. Just to belong to a group. Yeah. And even if they don't know anything about the side they've taken, to, to keep that stickiness of the group, they will defend that position vehemently yeah. yeah yeah and that's why this shit happens because people want to feel like they belong but like man like i don't know i i'm on a lot of pet web pages that's where i like that's where i feel i belong looking at cats and dogs and shit <laughs> seriously i'm not that's a lot better man that's a lot better. i don't have any stress looking at like i mean sometimes you do about mistreating animals but like by and large you know i can like watch kittens and like yeah. not get stressed about it you yeah. know i don't you know but that's what's going on it's almost like you know you got to root for a certain team and you know yeah. you don't even know the starting lineup but man these guys are great right I, it's a shame, man. It really is. It is a shame, you know, but I think that's what I was going through when I was working on Blackwood. And I, I don't think it's any. Now that the novel turned out the way it turned out. Yeah. Um, the, the other thing, too, in talking about this and looking back on kind of me getting disillusioned with things and really beginning to question things and never kind of looking back from that, I'm glad that happened to me now because I still have that in me and I. I'm very slow to get on any side, you know, I just, um, I want to know, I mean, I want to know what side I'm on, you know, I want to be very clear about it. I, I don't follow the crowd. I try not to follow the crowd. I'm, I'm mm. not really happy with labels. I, I've never been one to join groups or to, uh, be, want to be associated with, uh, a certain name or, um, you know, tag or label. And I think that a lot of that came from um, my teenage years and just kind of things that happened where I just, you know, okay, I've been living under this label and, you know. Oh, and it caused you to have a big question mark about the validity of that label. So yeah, you were, right. yeah. So you, the intellectual part of you realize, Hey man, I need to really dig into something before I make any kind of alignment and moving forward. Yeah. Absolutely. And yeah. like, you know, if, if you are one who, you know, likes to, you know, strap labels on your arm or on your back, like before anybody meets you, they've already decided about you. Like you, <laughs> you, you show up with preconceived notions and, right. um, which I, which I think yeah. really robs us of, in some way, you know, we're either positive yeah. or negative, you know, it doesn't matter. Yeah. You, I mean, they're going to be there. And I just, I don't, I've never really liked that for myself. And I, I teach my children now, like, you know, be careful of who you sign up with. You know, you need to know what they're about before you, you know, want your name associated with this or that or the other. Yeah, I agree with you, man. I've tried to teach my kids that really hard. Um, you you make your living as a writer now, Michael, right? Is that or do you have any other side hustles? That you still More, but I still teach yeah. a few classes. I still got a side hustle a little bit. Oh, that's cool, man. Where do you teach? Uh, a little college called Mississippi University for Women. That's awesome, man. Yeah, sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> do your, your class, your students must ask you all questions like this, no? Oh, yeah. We have some fun conversations. Ain't no yeah. doubt about that. Yeah, that's cool, man. Um, hey, man, talk about some of the low points, maybe, or dark periods that you've had to deal with in your own life and how'd you get through them? Um, you know, this whole writer thing was a low point for a long time. Um, yeah. Tell your story. Cause I read it. It was wonderful. I started out, like I told you, I didn't come to it till, till later. I was 29 or 30 years old and I really had no idea what I was getting into. I, I had no idea 
the time it was going to take, the dedication it was going to take. I had no idea how many years of rejection I was going to have to go through. And I'm glad I didn't because if I would have known, I probably would have quit, you know, <laughs> I probably would have thought it was futile, you know? So I went through, you know, I published some short stories, uh, my first few years into it, but I really wanted to be in do novels, you know, that's kind of why I got into it. So I started trying to write novels and I, you know, everybody's got one in the drawer and I've got one, probably one and a half in the drawer. And I stopped and started with a few other things, but it was just years of silence and rejection. And I just kept trying to get better. That's all I knew to do. Like every interview I read with any writer I love, even including Bukowski, you know, listening to him talk about what you got to go through to yeah. get there is what really kept me going. But I finally ended up writing this novella called the hands of strangers. And I could tell there was something different about it. Like I knew like, and I read enough to know like, this is good. And it might even be better than good. Like, I think I've done it, you know? And so I started submitting it to uh, editors and agents. And I think I actually had an agent take it on and she submitted it a handful of times and then she gave up on it. And then, but like what everybody was telling me is that, you know, we really love this. And you're really talented, but we can't publish a novella from a debut author. Like we need a novel, you know, it's just for marketing purposes. It's just not, we can't sell a 120 page book from a debut author. They're not willing to put money behind a novella yeah. for a new author is really probably what they were saying. I would imagine. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. All right. So then like, it wasn't about the rejection wasn't about the work anymore. It was about other things like marketing and, and uh, you know, um, budgets and this and that and the other, which was a different kind of rejection. And I think that one really hurt me worse because I was like, damn, man, I've been working my ass off for years and I've got this thing here now that I feel great about. And you told me it's a great piece of work, but nobody will publish it. Um, that sent me down a really dark hole to the point where like, I pretty much gave up like, you kind of give up all the time. You know? <laughs> I mean, I probably gave up driving to my studio this morning. I was like, I can't do this anymore. You know? <laughs> um, but I remember like, so I finally said, screw it. And I put it, I put it away and I'm like, forget it. You just got to start on something new. So I started on something new, this Gulf coast hurricane novel, which eventually became rivers. My first, my first novel. And I felt really good about it. And so I started, emailing the same editors and agents back about it who had loved the hands of strangers. I'm like, well, look, I got a, I got a novel now to go with it. And none of those sons of bitches wanted it then either. It was just, it was like, we never had those conversations. They were just like, well, no thanks. You know, not right now. I was like, what is going on? And I remember I, uh, it was, um, 2000, it was August of 2010. And, um, I was sitting on the back porch with my wife and she was pregnant with our second daughter. And I had just come to the end of the rope with it. And I said to her, I'm going to give it until the end of the school year, the academic year next May. And if nothing's happened since then, I'm just going to be done. Like I'm going to keep, I'm going to keep writing rivers. I'm going to keep trying to submit the hands of strangers but I'm, I'm serious. Like I, I can't, I'm done. I can't do it anymore. It's taking too much out of me. Um, so I actually marked the date on the calendar when I was going to quit and be done. And, uh, and I said, you know, if that time comes, make I'm sure you quit tell your, sorry, I mean, interrupt you. Just make sure you tell your wife's response. Cause that was beautiful, man. And now, I, and that's why you're with her 20 years. Oh yeah. She, she understood. And she said, if that's what you want to do, then let's yeah. do it. Yeah. which and she had picked me up a bunch of times before right but i could she could tell like there was something different in my voice but she said you promised though you're gonna keep keep going to may i was like yeah i'll keep going to may and yeah. then we let it fall and um three months later or maybe it was like it wasn't even that long it was like six weeks later like into september i was up in the middle of the night i couldn't sleep um, and I just go, happened to go and check my email. I had an email from this little small press in North Carolina that I had sent my novella to like a year before. And they said, um, Hey, we really like this. If it's still available, we'd love to publish it. And 
that's what that was always my favorite part of that email if it's still available I'm like yeah yeah I don't know. let me look and see if it's still <laughs> look there it is um that's a very yeah. southern thing you know like in the south they would say that if it's a bit, let me be like really courteous about it like that wouldn't have been so sweet from a guy in new york he wouldn't have been <laughs> yeah. he wouldn't have been very polite yeah, yeah right right it's nice so i said hell yeah and i basically gave it to them and they published it in april um but that like saved me and like that re re-energized me so i sat down and i like really wrote my ass off through rivers just like really worked on it then so when the novella came out like you know, I knew it wasn't going to get in bookstores anywhere, but I thought it would get reviewed, and it did. It got a um, starred review from Publishers Weekly. Right. And the, the editor there wrote me, he goes, I've been sending them books for 10 years, and we've never gotten a starred review from them. I was like, That's all right. Cool. So now I was like, fuck all those other agents I've been dealing with. I'm going to find <laughs> some new ones. And um, I got my book out, and I found like four or five that I thought would be really interested in like Rivers. And I emailed them. Every one of them asked for it. One of them took it, and it sold in like nine days. I mean, it was just like, bam. That's so, so like, cool. Before May even got there, not only had I had I didn't have a reason to quit, but I had had one book published and another one accepted and sold for publication. So the the uh, the moral of the story is you got to give up. <laughs> Once you give yeah, up. Yeah, yeah. I think so. You have to accept that if it doesn't work, I'm okay. Yeah. yeah. But um, I don't know. Like, I, but I was to the point where I had marked on the calendar when I was young, when I was done. You know, and that was a pretty dark time. Yeah, man. And I, it, it was really stressful because of, we had a four-year-old and I could see my wife's belly growing every day with the next one. I mean, it was a... Uh, it was tough, it's man. Pressure, man. It's a lot of pressure. It was, I've, it I've was. felt that pressure. It's very tough, very heavy on your head, man. Yeah. And honestly, looking back, like I think the giving up thing relieved some of that pressure because I just went into like the hell with it mode, you know? It's either going to happen or it's not. And there's nothing you can do about it, you know? And I think that probably helped in some way. Yeah. Like I, we were talking before, when I stopped being part of the results committee, yeah. uh, it, it was a ton of pressure off and I, I, and I would genuinely let stuff go like that. And I said, look, I'm fine. Whatever happens, happens, whatever I do, I'm just going to do what I got to do and then not yeah. worry about the results. It, it is very weird how that frees you up. Absolutely. And I mean, it's something I even remind myself just about daily, you know, yeah. I, I can get caught up. Like the writing part of my day is the best part of my day. And it's all the other stuff, like the business part of it, the conversations you have and the wondering if you're selling and wondering if people like it and what the reviews are going to be. That's all the stuff that kind of drives you crazy. Yeah. Um, but you can't, you can't handle any, you can't control any of that stuff. Yeah. You know? It's a constant battle to just let it go so that I can keep being a good place, uh, good place of mind to where I can just keep creating and be energized by it all. Yeah, for me, it's just like, I I got, I dismissed so much stress that it was surprisingly pretty easy for me to do it. I just, yeah. uh, I just realized how much stress I was self-imposing and I really did got sick of doing that. And yeah. it was just like, I don't care about, I mean, I, you know, like I watch numbers of the show, the podcast and oh, it's up, it's down. And I'm like, I don't care, man. I'm yeah. going to just do the show, have fun. And if people are enjoying it, great and I'm not going to worry about the numbers. Yeah. You know, it's, it's like Cormac McCarthy's one of my favorite writers. And, uh, you know, he's famous for like, he, he never, even his early books when he was only selling like a couple thousand copies, his first three or four novels, he would, his publisher would beg him to go on book tour. He didn't want to do it. He wouldn't do it. And he wouldn't do any interviews. And even as time has gone on and his career has grown and all the movies and the prizes and everything, he still just doesn't do it. And I used to always kind of wonder about that. I'm like, why would he, why wouldn't he do that? You know, cause he really like, he just ignores all that. Um, cause I do, I enjoy going out and talking to people about your work and stuff like that. Having something yeah. new. But the old kind of the older I get and the further I get into it, like I really like sense now where he's coming from because it kept him separated from all those things that you do, all the stress you do kind of self inflict. Oh yeah. Okay. I get it. It makes sense to me now in some yeah. way. I think there's a balance obviously. Um, but still, I can understand that. Whereas before, I was always like, man, if I ever have a book, I can't wait to go on book tour and all this and that and other. 
Now I'm like, you know what? I, <laughs> yeah, the first I, 25 are good, but <laughs> I think I get it now. You know, is is Hands of Strangers available? It is, yeah. Okay, in regular bookstores. Uh, some bookstores, yeah, but you can um, yeah, on my website you can find it available like with all the other books. But Great. yeah, but yeah, it's readily available. Hey, so I want to ask you, you are a, a, a musician as well. You're a guitar player. Let's talk about that for a few minutes. Yeah. And I got some notes here. You started playing guitar at age 32, but you started writing songs pretty quickly. How, how did that all come about and what made you wait to 32? Well, you know, I was always kind of one of these people who I was like, well, I sure wish I could play guitar, you know? And then one day my wife was like, why don't you? Why don't you just shut up about it? <laughs> She actually bought me a guitar and um that's was pretty in, cool. Yeah, and I set it over in the corner and looked at it for months and then finally I was like, okay, now's the time. And so I picked it up and like learned some chords and uh just really enjoyed it, you know. Um and then like as soon as I got comfortable like switching chords and and I'm still I'm just a chord man, you know. I, I know like eight chords. That's like the my entire catalog. But I really like, uh, I wanted to like write some songs, man. So I just started doing it. I started writing some songs and it was a good way to like feed my creative energy, like in a different way. Sure. Um, and it's something I could sit down and like write a song one night and like have it, you know, I can't sit down and write a novel or even a short story. Um, <laughs> But I could sit down and write a song and like feel it and just know that I've like kind of done something. I think it kind of fed me in that way. So later on, like once I got more comfortable playing, like I started playing with some guys and I was like, Hey, I got some originals. Y'all want to mess around with some originals? And they were like, of course. So, you know, we started playing some original tunes. We go out and, you know, play a set list. Half, half the tunes would be original. And I just really dug it. And, you know, we worked on songs together and it was, uh, it was a lot of fun, man. One of the cool things about it for me was, you know, when you're, you're writing a novel, or anything else you're sitting in a room by yourself for a long time yeah right you write a song and I, I still love this was still one of my like most interesting things creatively to do is to write a song on your acoustic guitar go to band practice play it let the guys hear it and then slowly feel the thing come together like with the bass and the lead and the riffs and then the drums hit and it like becomes its own unique thing you know in a collaborative sort of way you know i love that feeling of the first time you're like okay let's try it after you've kind of noodled around with it and then like it bam goes into the first verse and you like hear that thing with everybody playing and it's like this real uh full collaborative like group effort to put this thing into motion and then you can go out and play it on saturday night at the gig and you gotta get response from it like that you know you don't have to wait a year and a half till the novel comes out yeah you know, some type of response from it um i loved it dude and I, I kept i kept writing songs and playing with a couple of bands until uh kind of really my book career took off and my kids got you know in the house and uh it just couldn't maintain it anymore which is the oldest story in the book i guess but uh I still do. I love it. Like strumming guitar. I'll do it in the morning. Sometimes when I come in here, just kind of get my juices flowing. Um, before I, before I write. What did she, what kind of guitar did your wife buy you? Oh, I can't, I don't remember what it was. It was blue. You know, I think she grabbed it at a pawn shop somewhere. I, I have a, uh, and then I kind of upgraded my equipment over the years. I have a, I have a Fender acoustic electric and then I have an Epiphone Les Paul. Yeah with a blues junior amp tube amp and uh um, great amp yeah and i saw the rest of my gear over the years but uh I, those are the two i hold on to that's cool man so that's, yeah. it, that's that's a nice story what's the uh first record you ever pr or yeah be record for you what's the first record you ever bought oh man you know what's funny is um i remember kiss records for some reason probably because of the uh just how cool it was you know? <laughs> yeah, the makeup and everything just like the album with the makeup and just, I don't know. I think kiss destroyer two had to be pretty close. I don't know that I bought it. I think I actually borrowed it from my neighbor and never gave it back. Or <laughs> um, I don't know. I remember buying 45s, a lot of 45s. 
Um, but for some reason, like the Kiss albums, because I can visualize them so well, yeah, kind of stand out to me. I think it's so cool that vinyl has come back too, man. It's awesome. It is cool, man. We've it got is. a great record store here in Oxford called the end of all music. And, um, like, it's cool. Like taking my daughters in there because they don't know what the hell it is. Right. Oh yeah, that's right. Yeah. And so it's been like education, a cultural thing, like, and plus a music thing too, you know, for them, for us to go buy a record and bring it home. And I let taught them how to use the, use it and play it and spin it and everything. So like, uh, it's been kind of like a family thing and like a weird sort of way to like listen to vinyl now. That's nice, man. You need all those family things. They add up. And then when they're older, like my kids are older now, they always, Hey man, I really love doing this. That was so much fun that you'll get a big pat on the back then, man. Oh yeah. I hope so. How do you know Jimbo? Just from being Mississippi boys and both being in the creative work of things, you know, he, uh, I mean, I've listened to his music for a long time. Yeah. And then uh, a guy who plays some guitar with him, I met, and he goes, you mean, and he goes, like, hey, man, I like your books. I was like, cool. He goes, you know Jimbo Mathis? I'm like, well, yeah, I know who he is. This was probably four or five years ago. He's like, man, he loves your work. I'm like, really? So he kind of hooked us up, and like one That's day I got cool. a text message or email or something from Jimbo. Um, and we live, you know, in the same place now, so – uh yeah, we just got to know each other that way, you know, which is cool. awesome. It's been very cool. He's an interesting cat, man. Very soulful guy, man. Really, <laughs> really soulful human being, man. I really dug him. Very real, no airs. Yeah. You know, no, his rock star bullshit. I mean, he's a very straight guy, man. I really dig his I know. One of the very cool things about hanging out with Jimbo is, like, you realize, like, all the things he's done, the people he's done it with, and stages he's been on, this and that and other. But when you're standing out – you know, drinking a beer with him outside of his kind of garage where he keeps all his gear and stuff. It's like, he's just the dude. Yeah. The dude standing there drinking a beer and nobody else, you know? Yeah. Yeah. He's very, very real guy. Absolutely. Hey, give me your top three desert Island discs, Michael. Man, I saw that question on there and I've been thinking about this. <laughs> it's tough, dude. <laughs> Cause I was like, what kind of mood am I going to be on this desert Island? Yeah, just for just for now, like for the, for this minute. Obviously, like this will change. If I could ask you later today, it would change probably. Well, you know, when I was twenty one, is when Pearl Jam's Ten hit. Mm, came great out. record. That record meant a lot to me and still does. Um, Driving and Crying, Mystery Road. And if you hadn't seen the documentary Scar But Smarter about Driving and Crying, that would be a cool thing to watch. I will check it out because I don't know much about. I mean, I. I've heard of them. I just don't know much about them. What's it called? Yeah. Scarred? Scarred, but smarter. Okay, thank you. Yeah. So I think Driving the Crime Mystery Road, Pearl Jam Alive, or Pearl Jam 10. 10. And, uh, you know, I think I got to take a little Lucinda Williams with me. I'm not sure which album, but I just, I feel like I'm on a desert island somewhere. Lucinda's going to speak to your soul, man, when you're watching the sun go down or come up or whatever. Like, you just got to have that. She's a soulful gal. Right on, man. You know, it's really funny. Uh, so, like, recently, I have a massive spate of people from the Delta that I've started running into. And I don't know if it's – yeah, I don't know if it's one of those things where, like, did I not – did I have – you know, sometimes, like, you get a, a Volkswagen, all of a sudden you see, oh, everybody's got Volkswagens or, you know, something – and I don't think so because I'm pretty cognizant because I'm always interested where people come from. Very interested in that. And all of a sudden, like, um, uh, Greg Morrow, he's from, uh, he's a drummer in Nashville, but he grew up in uh, Memphis. Yeah. And, uh, do you know who Ty Tabor is? I don't think so. He, he grew up in the, familiar, but... he's from a band called King's X. Mm -hmm. They were really big and a great solo career. Uh, really a talented guy, but he grew up in the Delta. It's, I was like, how the hell, like one after the other. I was, this is really weird, man. So, uh, sure. and I'm like, man, bring it on. All of you Delta cats are very, you know, very soulful, very real, you know, yeah, we're and, coming uh, for you, man. Yeah, man I'm, I'm here. I'm open. Yeah. And like this guy, you do the same, everybody from that area, there's a way of speaking that's extremely descriptive. Mm-hmm that it's almost sounds like 
you all grew up with the same dude on the porch telling you stories <laughs> because like, like you don't describe things casually. You're really specific about the descriptions and a lot of them are related to nature, Yeah, which is easy to understand, you know, yeah. and it's easy to visualize something like that. So it's just weird. All these Delta folks now. <laughs> um, hey, tell me the most important things you've learned about yourself. Uh, I've learned that um, you really got to hold my head underwater for a long time to make me give up. Good for you, man. Resilience. Yeah. See, just what I'm talking about. Like a normal guy, normal, a non-Delta person would have said, oh, I'm, I could come back. You said, I got to hold my, you really got to hold my head underwater a long time. See, that's what I'm saying. There's like very vivid descriptions, man. It's very inherent to all you guys in the Delta. I love that, man. Um, most important thing your dad taught you? Um, my dad, who I didn't feel like maybe understood me a long time through my 20s. Um, but I think he did too because he had the wanderlust also. But when I finally came back around and I was trying to think about if I wanted to write or not, and I kept just kind of knocking it around. He finally looked at me and goes, if you want to write, write. And that was it. That was his advice. And in, you know, and I bet that was important to you. In a nutshell, he was saying, look, if you want to do something, then shut the hell up and do it. Yeah. Very good lesson. Yeah. I, I bet that was really important to you. That's nice. How about your mom? Most important thing she taught you? I would go back to the empathy thing, you know. She taught me to to love, which is very important. Do you have any uh, hobbies or interests outside of your business, outside of writing? Oh, uh, you know, I play the guitar a little bit, but you know, when you got two daughters in the house, that's kind of your hobby, isn't it? I mean, yeah, for a you while, know what it's like. yeah. yeah, I'm kind of yeah. doing what they're doing, you know. Yeah. But, you know, we like to, we're kind of outdoorsy people. And, you know, I try to, I run and try to keep in decent shape, you know. So yeah, well, you look like you're really fit. That's important, man. It's, yeah. to, it's so important, man. You know, there's the old stereotype about the Southern writer sitting there with a glass of bourbon next to his laptop, you know, and churning it out. But you, you got to take care of yourself, you know. I still like my bourbon, but. Hell yeah. Not in the morning. <laughs> what kind of bourbon do you like? I've been a maker's guy for a long time, but I've recently been drinking uh, Eagle Rare, which is pretty tasty. I have to check that. I, you know, I just got turned on to makers like a year and a half ago. Oh my God, that stuff is wonderful. It is too wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> what did you? What is this Eagle? Eagle Rare. Okay, you know it's a really. It's a lot, it's a lot like uh, makers. It's really very similar. I like them both quite a bit. Very smooth. You ever tried Basil Hayden's? Yeah. That's really good. I like that That's as well. Um, I'm actually drinking. I got a, a bottle of Elijah Craig small batch right now, too, that I'm in. I like good. Yeah. I'll tell you what I like, but it's never around. Is Blanton's. Yeah. It's impo to impossible to find that. Yeah. Down here, too. What was that other one? Elijah? Elijah Craig small batch. All right. Four Roses has a good small batch, too. Most important part of the important part of today's conversation. Hang on. That's right. <laughs> should have started with this. <laughs> uh, two more questions, man. I cannot thank you enough, too, man. You're I cannot thank you enough for doing this. You have found your calling, man, and you are incredibly like excellent at it and, and your ability to make people feel things through what you do is just off the charts, man. So thank you. I hope you keep writing for a long time. I'll keep reading for a long time. Thanks, Greg, man. I appreciate it. Oh, uh, yeah, man. Uh, toughest decision you had to make or most difficult thing you had to do? Oh, man. I really think um, cutting bait and willing to be broke for a long time. Because I'd just gotten married, too, when I made this decision to do this. And Sabria was with me all the way. Like, she never flinched when I said, this is what I want to do. But really willing to be broke and for a long time. Longer than I expected. 
and to put up with all the rejection. Um, I think there was a naivety to it also, like ignorance is bliss type thing that helped me along the way. Sure. But, uh, you know, when I started, I was at the age where my friends were, you know, having kids and getting promotions and buying a bigger house. And, and I was saying, you know, we're going to eat Cheerios for a while, you know? Yeah. So that that was kind of tough, but uh, it worked out. Last question, Michael, what's been the biggest change in your personality over the last 10 years and how much of that has been deliberate and how much is just a part of aging? Oh man. I don't, I didn't get down that far down the list of your questions. I wasn't ready for that one. <laughs> man, I think it's, it's hard for me to do still, but I know that children have been a part of it too, is just trying to just let go of things you can't control. Yeah. Um, I guess as I've changed in the last 10 years and gotten a little older, like, you know, there's my wife and my daughters and my work and everything else can kind of just sit off to the side. You Mm -hmm. know, those are the things that I try to focus on daily. Uh, Those are the things kind of fill me up from moment to moment. And, you know, there's a, you know, I don't, Sometimes I wondered with like maturity or whatever you want to call it. I don't think I'm very mature, but I think like maybe you might lose your fire a little bit, but I haven't found that to be the case at all. In fact, I I find myself kind of like retreating a little back in, retreating a little bit back into the things that I know are really important, like um, keeps me maybe even more motivated, you know? Yeah, I understand. Because I'm not, you know my biggest critics always myself and I'm always trying to prove something to myself. So I'm not going to have that problem, you know? Yeah. So I'm settling back into, uh, my girls and my work and kind of where I am from moment to moment, I think is really important. And I, I need to get better at it. I have gotten better at it, but I, I want to keep getting better at it. Yeah, man. It's one day at a time for everybody, you know, you know especially now this thing's really taught us, taught us that whether we wanted to learn it or not, you know, you know, most people I've spoken to outside of the financial difficulties have been like, man, this time has been really good for me. I've been, yeah. I've learned this or I've, you know, just relaxed. I mean, myself included for sure. I've learned a lot of things. Um, I really haven't heard. I mean, look, I'm not talking, I'm li- not living in la la land. I'm not talking to, you know, emergency room doctors. I'm not talking to wait staff right. or restaurateurs. I'm sure they have a lot less to be relaxed about, but yeah. most of the musicians and people I'm speaking to are just kind of like, Hey, this has been good for me. Yeah. I think it's my wife and I were talking about it last night, how, you know, I, this it has been a very quiet time for our family. And, you know, I, there's been some really, really good things about it. Cause you get in such a hurry r- blowing and going, you know? And yeah. I said to her the other day, you know, last six weeks, I would have been gone on the road on book tour. Like I wouldn't even, even hardly been here. Yeah. And the girls would have been in school. Like we'd have just been passing each other, but you know, we're sitting together and eating dinner all the time and sitting on the back deck and building fires. And, you know, I learned how to play chess, which I'd always wanted to learn how to play chess. I've learned how to play chess. I'm taking a beating <laughs> but, from your kids. Yeah. But I've learned how to play. So yeah, I think, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm like you, I have a great amount of, you know, heartache for everybody who's suffering because they're not being able to work. Oh my but God. Some people too are learning some things, hopefully that, you know, they'll continue on with when it's all over. It's just yeah. the notion of like slowing down and just enjoying where, where you are for a moment or two. I agree. Listen, let me tell people where to find you and, and, uh, what, what which of your books to check out, uh, Man, thank you for everything. You're like such a cool guy. I'm so glad we got to connect. I'm so glad I got turned on to your writing and uh, anything I could do to support it. I wish you nothing but tons of success and happiness, man. So thank you for everything. Thanks, Greg. Uh, Thanks for taking the time to come on the show. All righty. So I would love everybody to uh, connect with Michael Farris Smith. uh, Buy his last book, Blackwood. It is like it is phenomenal. Like I said, I, I, 
you know, I used to be a voracious reader. And once I started playing guitar, I kind of stopped because you can only do so much. I go to the gym every day, you know, five days a week, you know, you can only do so much. So when I picked up your book, it's like, hmm, uh, it was weird. I haven't read a book in a while. And I sat, and like I said, I sat down on a Sunday. It was really not, you know, cause we've had some non humid days. So it's been beautiful out. And I just pulled out a cigar and I said, Holy shit, I'm not putting this down. And my <laughs> wife kept coming out. Wow. It must be a really good book. I'm like, Oh my God, it's off the charts. So uh, get Blackwood and go to uh, michaelfarrissmith.com and you can see all the trailers and stuff and all the places where you need to buy it. Also, I would highly recommend the fighter. Uh, this, I mean, there, I couldn't tell you which one's better. That's like saying, you know, which penthouse pet is better looking or something, you know, they're both like excellent. I mean, very compelling books. You'll be like on the edge of your seat the whole time. Um, Go to michaelfarrissmith.com. Again, it's Michael Farris, F-A-R-R-I-S, smith.com. Um, also, follow him on Instagram facebook and twitter and he said he's looking to become the most active twitter poster in 2020 <laughs> i'm just kidding <laughs> uh if uh if this thing happens in la he will be there at the la times festival of books in october so man if you're into it or nearby stop by and say hello but read his book first so you can tell him you know how much you were moved by it also um I would really encourage you to go to writersbone.com and look up Michael Farris Smith and read that essay about his family, about his dad uh, being a preacher and just sort of getting run out of town. Um, like, you know, we'll talk about this some other time, but I was like, man, as I was reading it, it was like, I knew that was coming. I wasn't surprised. I hate to say it. I wasn't surprised at all because that's just, you know, human nature someone's got to be a victim and then someone else is you know anyway read the essay on writer's bone is very well written and it's like really good and um that's it anything else you're doing man are you making records are you anything else i could sell for you uh, no not right now man i've actually started I'm talking about having time to sit around i've tried to write a couple more songs recently but uh you know the we got film options on three novels and i'm yeah, working talk, on sorry talk about that um Blackwood, um, I'm finishing the script for that up today. It's option to the guys who are actually directing the fighter. Um, oh, cool. Yeah, they uh, really dug my work. Parker and Graham Phillips is their name. Um, they had a film called The Bygone. Their debut film came out in November. It's on Netflix now. I would say everyone check that out too. The it's Bygone the, on Netflix. Yeah. There's some talented guys, man. I'm lucky to be working with them. Um, we're getting those two into motion. And then Desperation Road also, um, I wrote the script for that. It's optioned and I'm um, hoping to move on that here pretty soon. Uh, the Fighter and Desperation Road are both starting to cast. So they're starting That's to move cool. a little bit. Any, I, can you talk about, you probably can't mention who's who's. No, not yet. Yeah, not yet. Dude, that is so cool, man. I'm so happy for you. Thanks, man. It's been I, interesting. I, I, I bet you when... Uh, you were sitting with your wife on the porch and you marked that shit on the calendar. You probably weren't thinking about something like this, right? Yeah. <laughs> right on. I'm so happy you got to experience it. That's great. The bygone on Netflix and then check out uh, Blackwood, the fighter and desperation road in the movies. And he's going to be on here again. I promise you, uh, man, anything else that you want to talk about or anything you want to promote? No, man, it's just, it was a pleasure talking with you. you oh man. Podcast. I've listened to, you know, some of your episodes. And I was really happy to sit down and chat with you. Likewise, man. Thank you very much. Let me say goodbye to everybody and I'll wrap up with you. Thanks so much, Michael. Yeah. Everybody, thank you so much for listening. Uh, if you enjoyed this, please share it on your social media channels with your friends. We appreciate your support. Honestly, man, if you are into reading, check out Michael Farris Smith by Blackwood. Go to michaelfarrissmith.com and uh, at least at a minimum, connect with him on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter and uh support his work he's a really talented guy and i'm not just saying that because i mean i digested these two books in a day each anyway uh most important especially nowadays man remember that happiness is a choice so please choose wisely be nice go play your guitar and read and have fun till next time peace and love everybody i'm out michael thank you so much brother thanks man